All right. Are you ready to go to God's Word today? Amen. So am I. So am I. Well, uh, those of you that are of my generation, my age or older, all know that getting old, it's, it's not the golden years, folks. It, it's, it, you're circling the drain is what's going on, you know. Uh, and there are just some things about it that I'm, I'm not a fan. I'm just going to tell you, I am not thrilled over. Uh, aches and pains and things that are just nondescript. And so Chris and I, you know, we'll crawl into bed and we'll just talk about that. Man, you know, what hurts tonight? Well, <laughs> you know. And uh, the, there, there used to be a tele... Well, I should tell you this. A couple years ago, I, I just needed some retrofitting, so I got a couple of new hips put in. Uh, about two and a half years ago, uh, I, I had actually, I had fallen through two ceilings at church, at, through roofs, two times. And the last time, straight on my feet, uh, which probably did a number on my hips. So I, I got these new hips put in, and that's been great. It used to be really hard to stand there through worship and things, so I'm, I'm really grateful for those. But um, all this to say that uh, ever since then, I, there's a little bit of trouble with balance when I'm going on, on hikes and things. I just have to watch out. But when I was a little kid, there was a show on TV, and I barely remember the show, but it was called The Real McCoys. There's some old people. <laughs> I have no idea what the premise of the show was. I think it's a bunch of hillbilly type people living out in the country or something. But they had Grandpa on there, and he wore... Uh, blue bib overalls, you know, and he always walked like this, you know, his shoulders going up. Saying, when we go on hikes now, or if I go to see one of my grandsons play basketball, and I got to walk out of, off the bleachers, and I'm going downhill, like, not downhill, but stepping on things like big steps down, I'm doing this. <laughs> and and I, I'm consciously trying not to. I'm trying to look cool. You know, I'm just trying to walk like I'm kind of cool. But I'm getting older. One of the things I miss most is my mind. <laughs> I have a horrible time remembering names. I forget names. I can remember stupid details or just minute details. This week, I went through my office at home. I had filing cabinets that hadn't been opened since uh, the Carter administration. <laughs> And I thought, I should start getting some things out and start getting rid of some things. And so it was a trip down memory lane. And I found things in there like the receipt for the engagement ring I bought Chris. <laughs> I know. It was a great moment. I looked at it. And here's the, the funny thing. Before I even looked at it, I knew to the dollar what I had spent. <laughs> and I knew the name of the company and the name of the model of the ring. I remember things like that. But if you walk up to me, introduce me to your family, and you turn and walk away, and Chris says, who were they? I go, I have no idea. <laughs> no clue whatsoever, their names at all. I forget names. One time, my grandson, who I love with all my heart, walked up to me, and he's talking to me, Grandpa, I love you. It's so good to see you. And I thought, man, I wish I remembered this kid's name. <laughs> I mean, it's awful, isn't it? But I, I want to tell you something. There's one name that I will never forget. There's one name that's etched into my mind because there are certain names that I won't forget. And this is one name I will not forget, and it is found in Hebrews chapter 13, verse number 8, where it simply says this, a little verse that we all know, and I think the writer of Hebrews, just in his writing, he just had to say this. It's like he shouted it. He suddenly says, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Right in the middle of what he's saying. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. That is a name I will never forget. That's a name that will be on my lips and on yours now and through eternity. 
Today I want us to look at the power of that name because as we're going to see in a moment, it wasn't just the one who wrote Hebrews who, know that, who knew that name. We know that name. Others have known that name. And we're going to take today a few minutes to look at the depth and the power of that name. And my hope for you today is, is that you'll have a renewed determination to hang on to that name, to call on that name. To know that the name of Jesus has been with you in the past. He's with you right now. He will be with you going forward. That's what, if Paul wrote Hebrews, that's what Paul meant. He's been with me in the past. He's with me today. He'll be with me in the future. Because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, if you look in the book of Psalms, the 103rd Psalm, we'll see how David just started exclaiming and explaining the power of, of that name in his experience. In verse number one, he says this, praise the Lord, O my soul. All my innermost being, praise his holy name. Praise his holy name, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Sometimes we, do, we drop names. You know what I mean by dropping a name? It's where you, it's where you, you use somebody's name because there is, you, you feel or I feel when you use that person's name or you identify that person's name that it will somehow grant you credibility or even a benefit. You know, if I could say to you, and this, I can't say this to you, but if I could say to you, I was just speaking with Franklin Graham the other day about some ideas that he wanted to bounce off me about how to reach the world. <laughs> See, that would have been a name drop. Or you might say, you know, I was thinking about the movies the other day, and Jim Caviezel and I were talking. I said, Jim, back when you uh, were in The Passion of the Christ, or this new movie, that you just have starred in about all these kids being set free and this freedom and everything. Jim, where do you think movies are going today? You know, if I say that kind of thing, I'm trying to lend credibility to myself. But when I use the name of Jesus, when I call on his name or identify with his name, it's not some made up thing. It's not some just out there, well, do do you really know him? Have Have you really called Franklin Graham? Have you really called Jesus? Have you really depended on him? Have you really walked with him? And the answer to that is, yes, I have. Yes, I spoke to him today. Yes, he was active in my life today. Yes, he worked for me today. Yes, I believe he's going to be with me tomorrow. And that's what David was talking about here when he's talking about that name. We are not just dropping a name. We are receiving benefits through that name. We're getting special treatment because of that name. Now, when David mentions benefits here, what it means is it means his treatment of us, his blessings, and the generosity that he provides to us. Every time something good happens in our life, we recall, this is the generosity of him. This is the generosity of Jesus in my life. Remember, David says here, remember his name. He says, forget not his benefits. Do you know what that tells me? We have a tendency to forget. We have a tendency to forget. When things don't go right, then we suddenly have this tendency to forget about what he's done in the past or to forget that he's in my moment, to forget that he's going to be with me tomorrow. Because we start, instead of focusing on the benefits and the relationship with Jesus, we're looking at the problem. We magnify the problem and bring it close and we set Jesus back. But God is calling us today through David's words to us to remember, to overcome our tendency to forget. I want you to also look at this verse. It's still on the screen. Look at the pronouns that David uses. The first pronoun is the word who. He says, who forgives, who redeems, who crowns, who satisfies, all these things. Who is he that he's speaking of? He's speaking of the Lord. He says, don't forget the Lord and his benefits. Who does all these things? The other pronoun in this is your He says he does it 
He feel, heals your diseases, lifts you from the pit, does this for you, your benefit. Who is the your in this story? It's you. It's me. So this is speaking about a relationship that we enjoy together. David is preaching good news to us. He's preaching the gospel to us. He says, God is for you, and here are the benefits he brings into our life. The Hebrew word for benefit is gemul. G-E-M-U-L would be the, or the way we'd say it in English. Gemul has to do with God's treatment for us. The word is often translated recompense. But in daily conversation, I have never brought up the word recompense. <laughs> Sitting down with somebody today, let's talk about recompense. You know, we go, what are you talking about? What's recompense? Recompense, which is an old English word that we see in the earlier translations, means to give back in return for what has been done. So, Literally, your paycheck is recompense to you. If you actually worked when you were at work and you would, you would get your paycheck, that's recompense to you. Now, God has not repaid us according to our sins. He's instead given us recompense according to his grace. So it's not our recompense, it's his recompense to us. So every good thing we have in our life, James says, has come from the Father above. It is his recompense to us, it's his grace to us. We're used to earning benefits. You go and you get a new job, one of the things you ask is, so what are the benefits in this job? You know, we got health, dental, vacation, uh, these kind of things. Well, those are benefits that are earned. God just grants us these things in spite of the fact that we have done squat to earn them. We can't pay for them. We can't do anything on our own for them. They're his benefits. So let's review them. Quickly, let's look at the benefits. Write these down on the back of your bulletin. The benefits that comes through Jesus Christ. The first one is, he forgives all my sins. He forgives all my sins. This literally is the Hebrew word awan. And it means something that is twisted and distorted. Our sins are not minor. Our sins are not just a little mistake. Our sins have literally twisted and distorted our lives and our relationship with others and with God. And if there is unforgiven sin in your life, we, we need to understand it is a twisted, distorted, evil thing and it is destroying our lives. David says in another psalm that he does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. God has redeemed us from our twisted way of living. He does not treat us as we deserve. He removes the sin itself, not just kind of makes a way and accommodation for our sin that we can continue in it, but he removes it from us. He doesn't just make us comfortable on our way to eternal death. He instead gives us an opportunity for those sins to be removed. John said, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, more than one time in these scriptures, we've seen the word all. David said, all my sins. John says, all unrighteousness. There is no sin, no twisted thing in our lives, no failure in our lives that Jesus cannot forgive and that he's not willing to forgive. We never come to him and we say, would you forgive me of this? And he goes, you know what? That has just pushed me to my limit. I'm sorry, I, I'm just, oh, wow, that stinks. No, he forgives all our sins. We don't have to carry a few of them forward or a handful of them forward or most of them forward. He forgives them all. And he removes the eternal consequences of those sins because we know the Bible tells the souls that sin will surely die. In Colossians, Paul says, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us. Again, here we go. All our sins. Sin makes us dead. Jesus makes us alive. Just think of it. You cross from death to life. Sin made you dead. Jesus makes us alive. And he heals, second benefit, he heals all 
our diseases. Wow. Hudson's family, he heals our babies. He heals our parents. He heals all of our diseases. David knew this, and he understood it even before Jesus went to the cross, even before Isaiah prophesied it. David understood and knew it. He is the one who heals all our diseases. Peter speaks of it in the atonement when he says, he himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. Every disease Jesus has power over. There is no sickness that God cannot heal. There is no illness that he cannot overcome. Our family has experienced such tremendous healings our, ourselves. I was healed overnight of mononucleosis. Our son was healed overnight when he had uh, pneumococcal pneumonia. Uh, this, our same son had a traumatic head injury, and, they, and we were told that he would have personality disorder probably through his life he might have seizures, and God healed him. We saw God change that and heal him. And that healing, those healing stories go on and on and on. And God is the healer today. And I want to tell you today, some of you who are sitting here going, I have a sickness in my body. When we have prayer here in a few minutes, I'm going to ask people who say, I need to have a healing in my body to come here and receive from God a healing today. He heals all diseases. He also, as I just said, he forgives sins. If today you say, boy, this is the day I want to walk in freedom without, the, without that specter of sin in my life, that can be removed today too because he's faithful to do those things. Another part I really love here is this third benefit. He redeems my life from the pit. Now, redemption, as you know, is a great theme of the gospel. It means to purchase back, to make an exchange, literally like a prisoner exchange or giving ourselves, give, someone giving themselves up so that you can be free. God bought us out of the slavery of our old life and, and set us into a new freedom. It says in Colossians that he rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. There are two applications to being redeemed from the pit. I think there's one that we most often think of, but there's one maybe today that we can give thanks for and an, another perspective to look at it. But the first one that, again, is probably most, comes to our minds, is that we ourselves are in a pit and we need to be lifted out. We need to be lifted. We're, we're in a, uh, Solomon talks about how a person who digs a pit falls into it themselves. And uh, here we, sometimes we have fallen into a pit and we literally have fallen and we can't get up. In the Psalm, first, or chapter 40, it says, He turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and mire, and set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. The picture there is pretty clear. A hole in the ground, slimy, muddy, mucky, there's no hope out. I used to, on Saturdays, get the joy all winter long of helping clean the barn. And uh, my dad would announce that we were going to either clean the barn today or move it. Which I have, to this day, I have no idea what that refers to, um, but we were going to clean the barn. And I remember going out and we would clean the barn from the cows living in there all week and outside there was a place where they could go and they could it was kind of covered but it was wet and mucky and I remember many winter days walking out winter my dad got me new boots you know the pull-on rubber ones that go clear up here which oddly I see young women wearing today <laughs> um, I was never thrilled at the gift of my new boots. <laughs> because my feet had grown every year, I needed new boots, and he's, hey, son, I got you new boots. I'm going, Dad, you are so generous. <laughs> because it just meant it was barn cleaning season, but I remember going out and being in the muck and mire so deep that they would go over the top of my new boots. And 
couldn't even get my feet out, and I was literally pulling and pulling, and there were times I'd have to yell to my dad, Dad, you need to come, you need to throw me some and help pull me out. It was so bad. There, there is a pit that David describes here that is not only a, a, a level place that's so muck and miry, but it's a hole in the ground, and there's no hope out. And a testimony that many people have is, is, I had taken my life down so far that I was in a pit I couldn't get out of. There's deliverance for that. But there's a second view of the pit I want you to think about. And that is this. When he redeems our life from the pit, it might be that he's just keeping you from the pit. Keeps you out of a pit is also a redemption. There are things that I have never experienced, that you have never experienced, that you will never experience. Why? Because God, in his keeping power, has kept you from them and will keep you from them because he is a shield to us. He is a redemption for us for things we don't even know that are around the corner, the things that we didn't know we could fall into or trip into, the addiction you never fell into, the relationship you never had to get out of because you never got into it, the habit you didn't have to break because he kept you from it. His keeping power is powerful, and he redeems our life from pits that we haven't even been aware of. The psalmist said, the Lord, amen, let's give him a thank you for that. Thank you, Lord. The psalmist says this, the Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forward and forever. Amen. I would like to suggest something that you, you write down that reference, you stick it on your refrigerator or on the mirror where you get ready, and when you're starting your day, Ask the Lord to do that. Lord, keep me today. Keep me on the right path. Keep me from the pit. Keep me from that place where I might fall. Be my protector and my shield today. Keep my coming in and my going out because you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. The next thing is, is it's kind of a natural progression. He crowns my life with love and compassion. He crowns my life. Now, this is, a, this is a picture mentally that those people could completely understand who are reading David because the king wrote this. The king literally wore a crown. How many of you all watched the King Charles get his crown? God bless you. Okay. Long live the king. I, I kind of tuned in. I've been to London, and I thought I might see some spots we've seen, and, you know, but you know what? That's an earthly king receiving an earthly crown, albeit the most expensive thing you can imagine, but it has no eternal significance. But God, he crowns our lives, and it has eternal significance. The crown that he places on us is one of love and compassion. So instead of the pit that we just talked about, we're crowned with his love and compassion. Instead of a life cursed with failure and going the wrong direction, we are a life blessed walking in his paths. He crowns us with his love. He pours out his favor. He sees us through love and compassion. Oh, I'm so glad I have a Savior who sees me that way. Not a critical Savior who's going, you know what, you're going to mess up. You always seem to mess up. You're always a huge disappointment. No, not at all. He crowns our life with his love and compassion, and he sees us with warmth and, and, and love. He, we're in his embrace. His love is great, greater than we can conceive. You ever seen the Grand Canyon? How many, well, how many of you have seen both the Grand Canyon and the crowning of the king? Okay. You're afraid to answer questions now. I, a lot of you have seen the Grand Canyon, let's say it that way. That, I'm sure you're going to agree with me, is a big hole in the ground. That's immense. When you look at that, you realize, man, that's big. That's big. When we try to think of something big, that's the kind of thing we think of. How big is the Grand Canyon? How tall is the tallest building or, or whatever? Think of this for a moment. How great is God's love? And when you think of it in the greatest terms you can think possible, you haven't scratched the surface. John said this, this is how God has showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. 
Not just that he can save us, get us out of the pit, but that we can live through him, crowned with love and compassion. And, David says, he satisfies my desires with good things. He satisfies my desires with good things. I actually looked at this section of scripture and thought, there's a series of messages here, not just a message. But think of this for a moment, how God knows your heart's desires, and it doesn't say he gives you what you desired, he satisfies your desires with good things because some of the things I've desired was not a good thing. Some of the things I've desired would fall short of what God really wanted me to have. What desires I have in my life, he exceeds. He gives me good things and my, my life is satisfied because his fulfilling of my desires are so powerful. On a human earthly focus, he, we, we often go off in unsatisfying disappointing things. We follow things that bring no satisfaction. We end up much like Solomon who lament, laments after he had everything. All the riches, all the relationships, all the properties, all the possessions, and he had had everything. He says, after I've had everything, my conclusion is this. It's all meaningless. He went after the wrong things. He was, he was dissatisfied. He is literally his generation's Mick Jagger who cries out, I tried, and I tried, and I tried, and I tried, and I ain't got no satisfaction. <laughs> also, ain't got very good lyrics. <laughs> God gives us what we need, not just what we express that we want. And if we will simply give in to and go with what he wants to give us, we will lead a life so filled with satisfaction, so filled with good things. He wants to lead us in that way. David, in Psalm 37, says, Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Put God first, delight in him, the desires of your heart will be fulfilled. And again, in 16, he says, You have made known to me the path of life, and you will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. Last thing David says is, He renews me. He renews me. Sometimes we need these things to be refreshed in our lives. Sometimes my wife will say to me, because I am her tech guy, my, you name it, computer, iPad, phone, is not working correctly. So do you know what I say? I says, have you restarted it? <laughs> then I charge her $59.95 for the <laughs> advice. <laughs> she says, oh, I always forget, I need to restart it. And nine times out of 10, that fixes it, right? You restart it. Did you know some of us today need to restart? We need to renew in Christ. We need to say, I need to go back to the place where life begins. I need to go back to the place of Jesus in my life, that I call on Jesus' name, that I look to the name of Jesus as my hope, my salvation, my strength, my future, my satisfaction. I look to him, and I need to be renewed in that. I need to hit Control-Alt-Delete and wipe away some junk and focus again on him. Solomon wrote in the book of Lamentations, because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed for his compassions never fail. And I love this part. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. What was Solomon saying? Get up every day and say, Lord, renew me today. Let's reset for this day. Let's forget about yesterday that didn't work well or the things that I blew it at, the temper problem I had, or the, or, or the sin that I committed and you've forgiven me. I'm going to reset because I'm going forward in you. I'm renewed today. And the, David says, when I do that, my youth is renewed like the eagles. I've got the strength to carry on. Well, let's go full circle, go back to Hebrews. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. This verse tells me 
something powerful. That he has been present in my past and in the history of those who have been before me. That he has been there doing what he has done. The Greek word for yesterday here is ichthys. And it means, it's, a, it's not about his pre-existence here. This is not that Jesus always existed, you know, like John talks about, before the beginning, Jesus was there. No, what is t- this is talking about his character. That his character has been unchanged through time. We don't have an Old Testament angry God and a New Testament loving God. We've got the same God. That Jesus Christ was the same yesterday. And the folks who, Hudson's parents, you know what? Already Hudson's healing is yesterday. You're, you're, You're walking in today already. You're already thanking God for what God has done because Hudson and the rest of your kids and you guys, you need Jesus today. But we look back and we say, he was faithful then. And it gives us something to to, to rejoice over. His hand in my life, his miracles he's done for me, the things he's done in the past. He opened the way of the waters of the Red Sea so that people could go through. And if he did that in the past, do you know he can do it again today? He can take you through the impossible today. You know, he provided for Elijah in the wilderness, fed him with ravens, and got a widow to give him food miraculously. If he took care of Elijah's needs in the past, he could take care of us today. He spoke to the wind and the waves when the disciples were about to die in the middle of the sea, and he calmed that and brought shalom to them. And if he did that before, don't you think he can do that again today? Because Jesus Christ is the same yesterday as he is today. He hasn't changed. If he poured out the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, he can pour out the Holy Spirit on the church today because he hasn't changed. Well, he's also in my now. He's in this moment. He's in my present challenges. He's in our present concerns. He's in our present joys. He's my strength for I need for this day. And his purpose for us is that we would live in this day, seize this moment, and wring out everything there is in it for his purposes today. That we wouldn't waste one opportunity because we are recalling his past works and faithfulness, and I have confidence for this moment. So we call on him in the day. We call on him today. The psalmist said, call on me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver you, and you will honor me. Notice God said, the day, right when it's happening, call. Again, the psalmist said, in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling and he will hide me in the shelter of his tabernacle and set me on a high rock in the day. Right when something is happening, the name of Jesus should be on our lips. And many people can tell you a story of Wow, just when a, when, a, when a problem came, when disaster was there, when, uh, when bad news came, or I was scared, or we needed a miracle, what did you do? You suddenly felt the name of Jesus in your mind, and it was on your lips, and you're calling out, Jesus, because he's the same today as he was yesterday, and he, he will answer. And we enjoy his presence daily, too. We're not going to just let the moment go without joy. We're going to enjoy his presence daily. The scripture says, this day belongs to the Lord. Let's celebrate and be glad today. It's talking about an attitude of going forward. Well, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and I'm enjoying all of his benefits. They're all mine. I'm going to rejoice. I'm going to rejoice with a band or without a band, with, with somebody with me or without somebody with me. If I'm having a great day or I'm having a challenging day, it doesn't matter. I will rejoice because God has made this day and I'm going to rejoice in this day. Well, finally, he holds my future. Our future is in his hands. All the plans that are going to pan out are because he was working in the future. All the plans that didn't work out, he was still in your future because he's got something even better for you coming. All of my worries, he is in control of. And let me just add that Jesus commands us not to give in to worry. Nobody worries about the past. We all worry about the future, right? That's the very nature of it. We worry about the future. Worry does no good. 
Worry only, ex only ex takes all the energy that you should have for the moment and invests it into the future on things that most likely won't happen. Will Rogers, I'm not saying he was a theologian or a Christian or anything, but here's what he had to say about worry. He said, I know worrying works because none of the stuff I worried about ever happened. <laughs> he goes on to say, worrying is like paying on a debt that may never come due. Worrying. We're not going to worry about tomorrow because Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and what? Forever. He's, he's in my future working on our behalf. So if you're like me and you're growing more mature, <laughs> as you get old, you can actually see the finish line of life. He's in your future. If you're younger and you say, man, it's all out there for me ahead. I've got so many possibilities, so many things I'm looking forward to. I want you to know he's in your future. As you are praying for your kids, your grandkids, as you're thinking about starting your own family, he's in your future. If you're in a marriage right now, I want you to know it's not just about this day in your marriage. He is in your future for your marriage. Some of you are saying, I think this day might be the last day because I've about given up, I've about had it. Don't do that because God is in your future and he has a future for you because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He will take you through to that future. He will bring things together for you because God is working for you. Those benefits that we just spoke of can be in your marriage as well. This truth that I'm speaking of to you today is tested. It's not something theoretical. The great leaders of our faith have known it. Moses knew it because he knew God face to face. He said, God is not a man that he should change his mind or lie. When he speaks, he acts. When he promises, he fulfills. And he said, he keeps his covenant to a thousand generations. Samuel knew him as the glory of Israel. And he said, he does not relent or surrender his authority. Job discovered that no one can oppose the purposes of God and that his, his will will prevail. David declared that the Lord's plans stand firm forever throughout all generations. In his experience, Solomon testified that everything God does or endures forever and that nothing can be added and nothing can be taken away from it. Isaiah saw God who swore to him that every purpose and plan that he had was going to stand. Malachi knew him as the unchanging God. The apostle Paul assures us that God's gifts and his calls are irrevocable. And James infuses us with confidence when he writes this to us. Every good and perfect gift comes from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. That's the God that we serve today. I want to ask you right now, how are you viewing the times of your life? Because we all have three times in our life. We have our past, we have our present, and we have our future. How are you viewing your times? Is the past holding you back? It could be that your, your past is holding you back because you look back with regrets and you think, I can never be useful. I've, I've done such awful things. Don't forget, he forgives all our sins. All the twisted things of our lives, he straightens. It might be that the past is holding you back because the past is just so great for you that you can't get into today. And it's time to let go of those things. Scripture even says, it's common for us to say the past is always better. Maybe it's time to let go of the past and to move into today for what God has. You might find this present moment is overwhelming to you. The day you are living in right now, your today is overwhelming. Listen, God is greater than anything you could face. All those benefits that we spoke of are yours today. The experience that David said you could have is yours today. Seize it. Receive it from God today. And if the future is bringing you anxiety or fear, listen, Jesus, who was the same yesterday, is with you today. He will be with you tomorrow. He said, don't worry about those things. He says, I've got it. Because tomorrow is like yesterday to him. He knows it all. Whatever time may be holding you up today, God is your ever-present help. I want to encourage you today to look forward with confidence that God 
is in you. 